Good afternoon. Um, I think we should start the webinar now. I see there are still people joining us. And to the other panelists, please do remember to keep your mics on mute when you're not speaking, just for um, the sake of audio clarity. So welcome to the third in a series of webinars by the Secretariat of the Platform for Co-Regions in Transition. I'm Robert Pollock, and I'm a senior advisor to the Secretariat for Co-Regions in Transition. I'm delighted that we have a wide range of stakeholders joining us on this call to this morning or this afternoon. We have representatives from development agencies, trade unions, NGOs, power companies, academia, and of course, regional and national government. And this is really an opportunity for us to collectively reflect on the importance of employment and welfare support in the context of co-transition. This is a key policy area for not only policymakers, but practitioners and a wide range of actors, whether they be NGOs or in the private sector. I think it's important to reflect that if energy transition is to represent a just transition, it has to be more than just decarbonisation. It has to also address labour market transition. The two are interlinked, energy transition and labour market transition. Given the significance of the topic of sustainable employment and welfare support, I'm pleased to say that the Secretariat uh, to the platform has actually recently developed a toolkit on the issues of addressing sustainable employment and welfare support in regions undergoing co-transition. And this will be very much at the core of today's webinar. So let's turn to today's agenda. Thank you. We have a very ambitious agenda today uh, to cover in one hour, but I'm confident we can achieve it. We firstly have opening remarks by Anna Sobchek, who is the policy coordinator for the EU co-regions in transition, and also the Just Transition Fund in the context of the EU Green Deal. Now, Anna is critical for providing leadership and strategic direction to the platform for co-regions in transition. And today, Anna will be placing the, the issue of sustainable employment and welfare support in the broader context of EU policy in regard to just transition and a green recovery. And obviously, there has been much publicised in those policy areas in recent months. So we look forward to Anna's contribution. We also then move on to presentations by Andrea Broughton and Timon Venert. Um, they will be presenting the toolkit that we have recently launched that I referenced earlier. Andrea is an associate director with the chorus, and Timon is a senior member of the Wuppertal Institute team in Germany. <clears throat> and as you're aware, these are two organizations that form the consortium that provides the services to the secretariat and the platform. So we look forward to their contributions. Consequently, we will have very much contributions from practitioners and policymakers who are very much living with the reality of labor market transition. So our first featured speaker is Maria Bellarmina Diaz Aguado, and Maria is the Director General for Energy, Mining and Reactivation in the Principality of Asturias. And Maria will be very much focusing on how you coordinate actors at the regional level to achieve economic diversification and sustainable employment in the longer term. Now, I'm very fortunate that I've worked uh, with Maria in the context of the platform's technical assistance program, START, and I'm very impressed by the level of social dialogue in the region of Asturias. So I think this will be a very interesting uh, presentation. Finally, we have Sebastian Storm, and Sebastian is a senior advisor at the Just Transition Center of the International Trade Union Confederation. Now, the center was established um, a number of years ago in 2016 
to ensure that actors engaged in a social dialogue about just transition and what it meant for enlightened labour market evolution and labour market reform in the light of decarbonisation of our energy systems. And the 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 centre is critical for promoting social dialogue and ensuring that the voices of the labour force, a critical set of actors in transition, are heard. And Sebastian will be reflecting on how do we convert the rhetoric of just transition into reality of just transition, especially in the context of the labour market. And he'll be looking at some national examples. So I, I very much look forward to that. Now, in regard to the format for today, if we could just move on to the next slide. As I mentioned, we have quite an ambitious agenda. We only have one hour, but I'm confident that we can cover a significant amount of these topics in that time. I, all participants are muted, so please, if you do have questions, please use the questions panel to submit your questions. Now, as I said, I think we have a quite an ambitious agenda today. We may not have as much time for questions as we would like. Um, however, I can assure you that if you submit a question, we will consider that question and get back to you in due course. And we will be discussing that later today, how we manage the questions. And for your information, the webinar will be recorded and uploaded on our YouTube channel. So do not feel obliged to take copious amounts of notes as you will have access to the recordings. Okay, I will now hand, hand over to Anna for the introduction from the European Commission. Anna, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you to represent the European Commission and also provide you with EU policy context, uh, how we can support the labour market transition. It's a subject which is particularly close uh, to my heart, I have to say. Uh, I have been following this for many years in my previous capacity as well when I was working for um, industrial um, policy, SME policy uh, in the regional uh, context. So I really understand uh, quite well the different challenges that uh, all of us are facing and especially in the coal regions and transition. So talking about our current EU policy context, uh, striving to be the first climate neutral uh, continent um, and also to providing working for social fairness and prosperity is among the top priorities for our European Commission. It's very important uh, to know that, that we're really trying to do our best um, to reach those objectives and uh, in in this context uh, eu green deal puts forward measures to support labor market transition with a focus on just transition leaving no one behind so no region no stakeholder behind we really put a big emphasis on those aspects and we also recognize that uh, green and digital transitions are the driving force of many European policies. When you look at industrial strategy, clean energy, skills agenda for Europe, regional policy, we always talk about the aspects of green and digital transition and it always comes, um, comes up the issue of a mar labour market transition which as Robert highlighted before, uh, is an interesting part of the of the energy uh, green energy transition. And uh, in the context of European Green Deal, particularly, uh, there is uh, important instruments that all of us uh, think about, which is Just Transition Fund. And the Just Transition Fund specifically concentrating on the mitigating socio-economic consequences of the Just Transition. And among the main aspects of Just Transition Fund indeed is the upskilling and reskilling of the workers. So accompanying the labour market transition. 
that's one of the main uh, instruments that we put forward. And also we have been very fortunate that uh, in, in the framework of our EU platform for coal regions in transition, we're discussing different solutions and different, uh, uh, different ideas how to uh, accompany uh, just energy transition. And we're promoting the dialogue, including the social dialogue as well, among local, regional, national governments, but also businesses and trade unions who are very important partners in this in, uh, journey, as well as NGOs and academia representatives. And here uh, I also warmly invite you to follow us in, in, this, uh, in this journey of platform for coal regions in transition. As I mentioned before as well, your voice is very important to us, your opinion. We want to know what's, how, what kind of challenges uh, you're facing, how we can help you to adjust our policies accordingly. And for that, I would warmly invite you also to provide your input to the ongoing consultation about a strong social Europe for just transition. You have a link on this slide. We're carefully analyzing all the inputs for the consultations were launched. At the same time, I would like to also remind you that in uh, in 10 days, we're going to meet in the framework of Coal Regions in Transition Virtual Week, for when for the whole week we're going to discuss all different aspects which are important for coal regions in transition, carbon intensive regions. We're going to launch just transition uh, platform. So I hope to see you also there during the, the our Coal Regions in Transition Virtual Week. Thank you very much, and I'm wishing you a very uh, successful webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, uh, for thank you, Anna, for setting the context and the perspective of the European Commission policy environment. I'd now like to hand over to Andrea Broughton and Timon Denhart. As I said, they are key members of the Secretariat uh, support to the platform, and they have been developing a toolkit that has recently been launched on sustainable employment and welfare support. And I'll hand over to Andrea Broughton, who will then hand over to Timon, who will go through key aspects and dimensions of the uh, toolkit. So please, Andrea, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Robert, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm delighted to um, participate in this webinar to um, share some of the aspects of the toolkit that um, myself and Timon and our colleagues have been developing over the past few months. Um, the toolkit is on the Commission's website, so you can um, download it for yourselves, but this is just really an overview of the, of the key aspects. Um, so in terms of how the toolkit is structured, um, there are four pillars to it. Um, the first is, is um, skills, as you can see in the diagram here. So skills, um, anticipating skills needs, skills audits, um, everything to do with skills. The second uh, pillar is um, cooperation. So um, the cooperation between all the key actors. Um, so I'll give an overview of that as well. Um, the third pillar is the support that um, can be offered to individual workers, so comprising all of those aspects there. Um, and then the fourth pillar is economic diversification um, and, uh, and transformation. Um, so I'll be speaking to the, um, the first three aspects and uh, Timon, my colleague Timon will then speak to the fourth aspect. So in terms of skills, um, I think the first thing to say that it's very important to sort of keep on top of, of developments in terms of anticipation and to see what sort of trends are influencing um, the demand for skills. So we put a couple of um, what we would call mega trends there. So sustainability, um, the green economy and digitalization are probably two of the major um, mega trends influencing um, skills policy at the moment. Um, if 
if there's not the right awareness of the impact of these trends that can lead to skills gaps and skills mismatches in terms of the skills that workers have and the demand for skills um, but if managed correctly these sorts of trends can really offer quite significant opportunities for employment and growth in regions so it's very important to be aware of the sorts of trends that are having an influence um, so in order to do this uh, it's key to have some sort of forecasting function and anticipation function to sort of see what's coming up and to see the sorts of, of skills that are going to be needed because lead-in times of course for skills development are quite long in terms of uh, putting together courses to give workers the skills they need so it's important to have some sort of forecasting element and we have examples of um, uh, uh, of cooperation that that um, forecast skills so um, ideally in putting together some sort of forecasting and anticipation function uh, this this would be a, a partnership between everybody who has a stake um, a stake in this so key stakeholders so that could include um, local regional government and authorities, maybe national government as well, uh, individual companies maybe that are looking to invest in the region or who are in the region already, um, and of course social partners, so that's trade unions um, and employer uh, representatives as well. And we do have examples of um, partnership and cooperation in our toolkit. So that's anticipating skills needs. Um, the next area in terms of skills is really so when uh, there's a good awareness of, of, of maybe what's coming, linking labour supply and labour demand. So one of the uh, very useful things to do and, and is done uh, systematically in these types of situations is to carry out a skills audit. So just to see what sort of skills are available in the workforce. Um, and this can include not only formal qualification, but all the sorts of skills that workers might have and are using in their jobs but don't have a formal qualification for um, so it's it's good to see what is available in terms of the skills of the workforce and then you can see where the gaps are and think about um, how to put into place the skills that are missing um, so this is part really of a policy of attracting inward investment from new industries and new employers into the region to have the skills available to meet the demand from these new employers um, and also part of a policy of linking the local labour markets, the people in the local area, to maybe the wider opportunities in the region. Um, so people commuting slightly out of the region and working slightly out, um, but in, in the nearby surroundings of, of the region. And linked to this, of course, um, boosting local job creation by encouraging and supporting uh, people wanting to set up their own business, businesses, so entrepreneurship, which is a really important part of um, any regional generation regeneration strategy. Um, so the next slide in skills is transferability. Um, so once the levels of skills are identified, um, key aspect is then to think about how these could be transferred to other sectors and other types of jobs. Um, so it, it's, it's sort of making a bit of an imaginary leap really thinking, okay, well, these are the skills available, these are the jobs that are done, but maybe some elements of these jobs and the skills needed for these jobs can be transferred into um, other sectors. Um, uh, so in, in, the, in the context of mining, for example, um, there's a lot of physical work, a lot of technical knowledge required, and sometimes the jobs require strength and quite fine motor skills and coordination. And these sorts of skills can be transferred to other sectors so construction is is, is one of those sectors um, and just to say also a, a lot of the jobs uh, that are being lost are relatively highly paid with good working conditions and obviously ideally um, it's it's important to try and match that level of, um, of, of working conditions and also health and safety okay so in terms of cooperation and I know that Maria is going to talk us uh, through a more practical example but just to say a few words about this um, I think the main thing to say is that it's it's very important to bring together all the people who have an interest in making this work so the key stakeholders because that means that uh, different voices will be heard and different voices will contribute um, to, to the plan so I've listed there the different types of stakeholders. It's a non-exhaustive list, of course, but you'll see there. So individual companies, different levels of government, 
social partners, so trade unions, very important. And Sebastian will say more about um, the role of trade unions in his presentation. Um, all of those involved in training provision, all of those who are involved in giving advice and guidance to, to workers um, and other people involved in this. Community representatives can also play a role. Um, and public employment services, of course, um, are a key actor in all of this and funding bodies as well. So that's a range of different interests. As I said, it's a non-exhaustive list and maybe other people in, uh, who would be involved, but that's the sort of people that you'd expect to be around the table. And then the next slide is about the process. So it's important to have a, an overall plan. There's a lot of people involved, a lot of different interests. So it's important to have the clear steps to manage this type of complex cooperation. So that would be things like setting up dialogue between the social partners, the trade unions, employer representatives, identifying who's going to be around the table, contacting these people, um, maybe then engaging with people um, to try and identify the ways in which they can contribute. Then when all of that's in place, to organise workshops and meetings to try to work out how the what the cooperation is going to look like. Um, then develop the specific roles and tasks for all the um, stakeholders. And of course, the timeline is important um, with a bit of flexibility because we know things can change, but it's important that people have a timeline to work to. And the last point is about um, developing monitoring indicators because it's important to assess impact and what works and what could be improved. So the third aspect, the third pillar of this toolkit is about support for workers. And of course, this is a really key aspect. And the first thing to say is that it's, it's important to involve workers fully in decisions as far as possible. So in, information and consultation, these are rights enshrined in European legislation, of course. Um, best practice is that uh, employees and their representatives, so trade unions by and large, should be involved and included early on, as early on as possible in the process of restructuring, because obviously this is a key thing that affects their employment and their future. Um, consultation should be carried out in, in a way that enables meaningful dialogue. This is also enshrined in EU legislation. Um, and best practice is, of course, when restructuring that is carried out is conducted jointly between employers and employees. So there's a common uh, way of working there leading to a joint goals as far as possible. Next element of support um, is, of course, that all workers are individuals. They all have their different situations and different needs. So it's very important to have individual conversations with, with people and to adapt things and tailor support as much as possible to suit their individual needs and their individual situation. So just a couple of examples that specific groups will have their own requirements. For example, younger workers will have different needs than older workers or those who are employed, uh, unemployed on a long-term basis. So the types of support that, uh, that can be offered are things like individual skills reviews, as um, mentioned earlier on, um, career counselling, where people would like to go, what skills they have and how they can use that, what their ambitions are for their careers, and the review of the, the training opportunities that are available to them, because by and large, there are usually quite a lot of, of diverse training opportunities. So to help guide individuals through the maze, I suppose, it's important to have good targeted and focused support. OK, and then um, the next slide in this is um, just a note about welfare support. Obviously, that is also a key part of helping people to bridge difficult situations. And I think the key learning from this or the key message is that welfare support should be a, a hand up rather than just a hand out. So helping people to move on, take charge of their situation rather than just sitting back and not knowing what to do, but getting money to get by. Um, and as referred to on the previous slide, different types of support would be appropriate for different types of groups. So, for example, for older workers, support will probably focus on income replacement, um, possibly also early retirement options if they're towards the very end of their career. So helping them to bridge that time um, towards at the end of their career. For younger workers, obviously in a completely different situation. So the support there would be much more centered on active engagement in 
uh, job search, so uh, preparation for job interviews, that sort of thing, um, and payments to cover maybe cost of travel um, to, to attend interviews. So um, I, think that's, um, I think that's the three pillars that I'm covering. So I'll hand over now to Timon to talk about the fourth pillar. Thank you. Yes, I'll gladly present the, the next pillar, which is uh, economic diversification. And um, just a sec, you want to see me also, I guess. Um, and in, yeah, I think the, the important point or important message for me is that it, it, it takes really a, a regional perspective to develop the economy of a region and make it, I would call it future proof. So it's, it is obviously about jobs for coal miners, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It's uh, jobs for the children of the coal miners and it's jobs for the neighbors of the coal miners. And um, as much as it is a challenge, um, I think there are also, if it's, it's not easy, but if it's done rightfully, there's uh, potentials for innovation and attracting investments into uh, coal regions. Next slide. I um, want to just highlight thing, some things and, and don't go into much detail. And I just invite you to have a look at, at, at the toolkit. And um, in the toolkit, as in all toolkits, we, we reference to a lot of existing material and data and things that are can be helpful. We've collected that and I think screened that and just chosen that, which we think that could be specifically interesting for, for actors in coal regions. Um, I just want to highlight one point in that is uh, clean energy, renewable energy and energy efficiency. And that we all know that there is a big potential in jobs in those fields. And there also is a big potential for specifically for coal regions. And there is a very good study uh, from the Joint Research Center, which uh, I would advise to have a look. It, it is interesting. It shows what the regions can do and what their potentials are. But I think we also have to be cautious. It's, it's obviously not a one-on-one -on -one substitution, a coal worker working for wind or energy efficiency in the future. Um, and we need to look into a broader uh, economic diversification, even if the jobs for renewables and energy efficiency in Europe in general are outnumbered the jobs of coal mining, for the individual region, it's, it's not a one-on-one -on -one substitution. Next slide. And this is just a, a basically a, a claim I want to make or, a, I don't know, inspiration I want to give. I think it's it's very important, um, Andrea said that in the beginning, to look at, at long-term megatrends, digitalization, what are the challenges for the region, but also climate neutrality, what, what is the challenge for the region, but what are uh, um, options for the region. And I think it's important the investments that we make in the next five, ten years to substitute uh, coal-related jobs and coal-related economies that must be future-proof investments. We don't want to be sitting here in this circle again in 10 years and said, oh, we put something on the ground, which again is outdated. We have to employ some long-term thinking. That's not easy if you have to act quickly, but I think that is absolutely necessary. And one of the um, challenges or one of the things to do is, is really think, okay, what is in it in this bigger framework of the EU Green Deal of making regional economies future proof also in the sense that there is business models we facilitate and support that are in line with the long-term strategy of a carbon neutral Europe. And um, I just keep it short at that because I'm much more interested to hear what uh, practitioners say. And with that, I would like to hand over to Maria Bellamina Diaz Aguadua from the regional government from Asturias. And as Robert already said in the introduction, you have in Asturias had quite some experiences with cooperation. And without any further introduction, Maria, I would like to hear what has happening, has been happening in Asturias and what kind of, I don't know, shares and recommendations and experiences you have you would like to share with us. Thank you very much, Timon. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for your kind invitation to share the experience of Asturias with you today and to be part of this uh, webinar. So uh, I would like to go on into the Asturias experience 
on sustainable employment and how we are affording this part of the just transition. Please, Martin. When I take a look at the four pillar approach that you uh, show in the toolkit, uh, I would like to say that it's not that we are not trying to anticipate skill needs for Asturias or that we don't want to provide support for workers because, of course, we do want to provide support. And we have very interesting experiences uh, at the central government with changes in legislation, in law, with plans developed specifically to support workers. So uh, with this, we are work, work, working together with the government. Or it's not that we are don't aim diversification and transformation in the region in order to promote new jobs. All this is true, but if I had to choose a part of our experience or a good practice to share, I would choose cooperation. Uh, and cooperation understood, as you can see in the picture below, cooperation understood as several hands supporting what we have, and preventing us from losing it or from dropping it to the floor because what we have is mining and what we have is the value of miners of experience of miners and what we have is people behind all that and we don't, we don't want to give up that and we don't want to give up, give up the strength of these coal regions uh, and at the beginning of this process of cooperation i have to confess that we had several feelings in there that i want to share with you too and these feelings were, uh, we, we knew we had to return hope to the territories and to the communities because they had been very uh, hardly beaten for many times. And we also had the sensation of feeling that it was probably our last chance as region. Asturias has gone under different processes of restructuring, of changes, reconversion, and we had somehow this feeling that it was our last opportunity. And uh, above all this, I have to confess too that we had some fear regarding the, the, this process of cooperation, because it's very challenging too. So please, next, next slide. And in the center of all this, we have to think that we are talking about just transition in core regions. And we repeat it many times, and sometimes we might be losing the, the sense of this idea. Uh, just transition in, in core regions, which are going to be the regions which are suffering the, who are suffering the most during this process of decarbonization in Europe and with this uh, commitment of the European policies with these climate uh, objectives which are very ambitious and in the case of Spain even more ambitious. So these regions are going to suffer a lot and most of our regions, Asturias is one example but I'm sure that most of you are in the same case, are also industrial regions and carbon intensive regions. So these core regions have to change from a past and a present based on coal extraction and, and power generation, as we see on the left of the pictures. We have to change all that to renewable energy, to energy efficiency, and to new capabilities and potential uh, activities in the regions. And we have to uh, achieve this through cooperation again. And I show you some of the capabilities of Asturias in uh, wind energy or in, in ships, uh, hydrogen or, or offshore ships, or in uh, energy storage. But this has to be done in a very short period of time. Please slide. So uh, I'm going to explain the Asturias case and what we did was we, contact, we identified and contacted the relevant stakeholders in the region with the aim of, of uh, establishing a social dialogue, a very intense social dialogue through workshops, through meetings and through cooperation, as you were saying before, Andrea, between different entities, between associations, between administrations, in order to receive proposals with different approaches from different parts and different sides of the problem. And uh, the cooperation uh, in the very long term, what, what aims is to have people at the center. And we want to have keep people at the center of our own decisions as government and as region. So it was very important for us to keep this in mind during all this process and keep people in, in, in the center. Yeah, please. Yes. We started this cooperation and this process through a to processes of private and public dialogue and cooperation. And, and we prepared some workshops and, and, and meetings with the groups of interest in different, let's say, lines or topics, immobility, gas mobility, or hydrogen or industrial uh, uh, residual heat. The last one was hydrogen, which started three weeks ago. And also we, we kept many bilateral meetings with all the associations, with all the involved companies, with the trade unions to know what their feelings were, what the projects they, they, could, they would consider for the region and what their interest was for the region on energy storage, on self-supply of energy, on biomass, rehabilitation, for example, of buildings, 
on my or mine reclamation and uses where the communities have a lot to say too and in this process we got some uh, successes and we can say that we were very happy with the results but there was something still missing on that we were listening to build up a bottom-up strategy in Asturias but we, we somehow realized there was something missing and that we needed to go a step further on this process of uh, cooperation so please next slide and, and with this aim, we created a committee to evaluate the impact of energy transition in Asturias, a committee which uh, integrated different agents and different stakeholders. It started in October 19 and it's still active today. We are about to finish all these works in the next, uh, let's say, weeks, in the very short term. But this committee has been working for months now. It was, it's been created under the umbrella, as you see there, of the National Ministry and uh, at the beginning it was a group of people as you can see there with uh, interest in the region stakeholders very active uh, agents in the region but in the very long run a group of separate people and this group was led or chaired by the regional minister of industry we had the vice minister on uh, climate change and environment issues there too and as much as many as 10 uh, director generals of different uh, on different issues for example innovation digitalization uh, european affairs or employment uh, a very active presence in this committee was that of the trade unions the most representative trade unions in the region and also we had the association of employers and of entrepreneurs in the region the local uh, council the local administration and the academia the, the university and research centers and uh, we developed works for uh, these seven, eight months in five working groups, one on energy, one on industry, another on primary sector and natural resources, because Asturias is very rich on these resources, the tertiary sector, uh, residents, commerce, tourism, we developed a fifth group on environment. And with all this, what we got was, a, a, let's say, a multidimensional approach. It's been very intense, and we turned from that group of people, separate people, to what you see on the right, a round table with people sitting there and working hard. In the case, for example, of the trade unions, there was people who was at the same time in the five working groups. So they had meetings every week or every so. And also there were three documents coming out of, uh, out of this, each of these working groups. So in, in the end, there were 15 documents, working documents, which has been very intense, as I'm saying, in, in working through this time. So please, next slide. And I have to say that um, the works of this committee, as you see there, have been uh, very, very positive. And I use this committee works in two senses, the works of the committee, but I also want to say that the committee is working. It's a good idea. I mean, we are very happy with the results. We are so happy that we've seen some other initiatives at national level that incardinate very well with this uh, dialogue or social dialogue. We have already uh, signed an agreement for urgent transition in the territories in Asturias in three different areas of Asturias with the national government and there is an open uh, participation a public consultancy open in these three territories so we are working all together in this process and I have to say that the, the works of the committee have shown this involvement as I was saying of the regional stakeholders at a very deep level it's really impressive to see how they dug into the documents uh, they make their comments and we have been working together we are now preparing a document executive uh, summary with, with with all the ideas and after that it's been revised also the, uh, the definite document and when this is done in the next uh, days it will be submitted to public consultation to the political parties and to other groups of interest in the region during uh, some days and we will get from that a regional position paper in energy transition so cooperation led us to that and all these uh, different people working in a table are now what we see in the picture, which is different pieces of a puzzle that can join all together. And from this, we have learned some lessons that I don't want to uh, skip the opportunity of sharing with you. We got a very good knowledge of the situation in Asturias. What is the current situation in Asturias? We could identify weaknesses and threats. Without that fear, we had at the beginning, and we really know where we are now, I think. We have been assessing potential capabilities and strengths of Asturias and all this with the idea of identifying opportunities and turning transition into an opportunity. Uh, this engages with the economic diversification and transformation that we also aim. 
and uh, it's also very important for us to never to never walk alone you know, as the football team we want to be walking together and being together through this social dialogue and with this we can provide support for workers and we have identified that now we need a uh, reskilling and formative itinerary itineraries for the workers and all this has to be done also through cooperation so i would like to encourage you to open your mind and, and even your heart because there is people behind all of this and to include include other perspectives and other um and other comments and observations in this process because it's a very complex process with different points of view and i think that as i was saying at the beginning all the hands are needed for this and so thank you very much Thank you, Maria, for such a, a, a rich and interesting presentation in regard to the experience in regard to the experience in Asturias. And as I mentioned, given that Asturias is one of the start regions, the regions support, uh, receiving technical assistance from the Secretariat, I have been impressed by the, the level of social dialogue and the sophistication in which you have approached mobilizing a wide range of opinions within the region. So thank you for really bringing the subject of cooperation to life through your presentation. I, I would now like to turn to uh, Sebastian Storm for his contribution. Sebastian, as I mentioned earlier, is a senior advisor at the Just Transition Center of the International Trade Union Confederation. And the center is very much at the heart of the ITUC, ensuring there is social dialogue, appropriate social dialogue, and the engagement of a wide range of actors, ensuring that the voice of labour is heard in the transition process. So I'll hand over to Sebastian for his insights. So please, you have the floor, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much to give me the opportunity to be here today with you and, uh, and to share the, the Indian perspective on, on this question and, uh, and also to hear the very interesting presentation uh, before me. I will try to be very, very short, but uh, as you know, there will no transition without a just transition, and the red line of that is a social dialogue, of course. Uh, just to remind you that the just transition was born already from a social dialogue process uh, in the ILO during... You can go to the next slide, uh, Martin, please. Um, this, as you know, this, the just transition was born uh, from a tripartite agreement in the, inside the, uh, the ILO in 2015, uh, where employers, uh, workers, and government decide to define what does that mean, just transition, what are the guidelines to follow, the principle to follow to achieve a just transition. Uh, next slide. And then we have the first recognition of the importance of this uh, just transition and the role of the social dialogue in this process uh, during the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, you know, seeing uh, the importance of the uh, just transition in the preamble of the Paris Agreement and uh, in the COP24 in, uh, uh, in Katowice, the Polish government uh, emphasizes uh, the importance to try to implement the just transition process inside the uh, nationally determined contribution of uh, every country. At this stage, uh, 56 countries already uh, ratified this uh, CISA declaration, uh, taking the engagement to um, put uh, the just transition uh, inside uh, in the center of uh, this uh, process. Uh, with this, uh, we were able, uh, it's great to have this, uh, 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 this concept defined, to have this. Uh, international recognition, but no, it was important also to implement concretely on the work field uh, the, 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 the just transition concept. It's why the ITUC and the ETUC decide to create the, the just transition center. The purpose of this center is to support the affiliates of the ITUC. Uh, all the affiliates represent something like more than 200 million of uh, workers all around the world uh, and try to support them to develop some to some uh, just transition plan. Um, they are good for the workers and good for the community. Um, we are kind of facilitator, we are that kind of checker to try to, to move them and to support them. Um, next slide, please. Now, we are now in the phases where we need to see that just transition is possible. And there is a few examples already existing uh, showing that it is a reality in part of the concerned part of the country. Maria was very, very impressive to, uh, to me to explaining the situation in, um, 
in Asturias. Uh, this will not be very, 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 very long. But uh, as you know, Spain is, with the Plan del Carbon, was the first country uh, in the world to have a national uh, plan uh, for, for just transition. Uh, they, uh, it was about the closure of all the, 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 the coal mines uh, not economically available, um, and uh, speaking about 1,700 uh, workers, and you need to find a solution from them. We are not speaking only about reskilling. This is often the risk when we speak about just transition, that we, we speak about just upskilling, reskilling of the workers. It's not only that. We need also to take a lot of uh, social measures for, for them, for the older one, for example, with the early retirement chains, uh, but uh, also for the younger uh, to try to uh, um, uh, to try to put new uh, uh, reskilling uh, chains for them too. Of course, there is a question of the of the investment uh, and. Um, uh, when the, the government of, of Spain put on the table more than 250 million uh, euro uh, to make it possible, it, it for sure it's a huge signal. This experience from Spain, and Maya was very, very clear on that, it's because uh, social dialogue and uh, cooperation uh, with the different stakeholders was made possible by the government. Without that, we will never achieve this kind of result. Next slide, please. Then you have, of course, the uh, famous uh, uh, coal uh, commission uh, in, in Germany. Um, first time that uh, we have uh, such a process, uh, so much a big process, putting around the table in Germany uh, so many stakeholders, but also, and maybe especially unions, uh, to see how can we manage the phasing out of coal uh, in, in Germany. It was, it was a difficult process. Uh, we had a very lot of contact with the unions from DGB, for example, uh, on, that, on that stage. But at the end, we have an agreement. And the philosophy of this agreement is that nobody will be left behind. Uh, every workers, we will find a solution. It will be by social measure like early retirement, it will be by reskilling, it will be by a standard setting package of the just transition measures. Um, we speak about, as you know, a closure of all the coal fire power by uh, 2038, uh, but we will need some uh, a huge amount of investment on, on this question. One more time, just transition is not about only about uh, uh, reskilling, it's not only about social measures, but it's also about investment. Next slide, please. The last example uh, will be about uh, Canada. Uh, Canada, we uh, create the just, the just transition task force for Canadian coal power workers and communities. Uh, the meaning, the means of the of this uh, just uh, transition task force was to find solution for the 3,500 workers affected in the community. Um, they, uh, it was a very, very inclusive process uh, where uh, unions, uh, stakeholders, employers, public authority, uh, local authorities were together on the work field to meet uh, people uh, who will be affected by this measure and to try to find some solution with them. They established a report with 10 uh, recommendations on employment insurance, on bridge pension and for older workers, on vouchers for skills and other retraining, agreement from operators to retrain, reskill and redeploy workers, for example. One more time, it's because you install a kind of social dialogue with a, a huge amount of, uh, of stakeholders that you will be able to find some solution. Next slide, please. As you understand, I think, I hope, from my presentation, um, when you speak about transition, you speak about different pillars. You speak indeed about skills and reskilling. You speak about investment and the importance to have a vision, to have a, a perspective and to, anticipate, to be able to anticipate it. Anticipate it. And also uh, the, the, the importance of the social security system. Um, all of this will be possible if you put around the table uh, the different uh, stakeholders involved in process. And especially because I'm coming from this side, but because also, and especially there are the first uh, concern on this process about with the, with the workers. Social dialogue is the keynote. It is because they will be involved that you will be, be, you will be able to make some, some change. Last slide, please. Um, this, yeah. Maria was speaking about 
uh, fears that she that she she met they met during, in Spain uh, on on uh, on starting the process. Their their fears are legitimate. We can understand that, but we need to transform to to move from the fears to the hope. And because of the transition process, you can to, uh, move from this one to the to to the to the to the, to the hope. This. Uh, I will make a last comment, maybe, on the differentiation that we need to make between cooperation and social dialogue. I think social dialogue is a part of the cooperation, but you need to involve a lot of stakeholders inside the process. But it's because you will um, ensure some social dialogue between uh, governments, employers, and uh, uh, representatives of the workers that you will be able to find some solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian, for such a, an excellent presentation. And may I commend all the uh, speakers for their focus uh, and timekeeping. And that allows us uh, seven minutes or so for questions and answers. Um, so I've been looking at the questions coming in, and we have a, a wide range of questions. And I'm not surprised, given the richness of the presentations this morning. Uh, however, as I said, the questions we do not answer, we will consider in due course and respond to. I would like to ask a question, one question to each of the panelists. So perhaps given that Anna spoke first, I would like to uh, pose a question to Anna that has come in from the participants. There is a great amount of support for the concept of nobody being left behind. However, if we are serious about a new green deal and a green recovery we need clarity on definitions rather than rhetoric nobody left behind and in particular we need indicators to understand what does just transition look like that leaves no people behind anna have you any thoughts on how we do evolve a more co comprehensive measurement framework around some of these concepts which are very noble but can that time seem abstract? Thank you very much for this question. It's really an excellent, um, excellent question uh, about the just transition and about the indicators. So let me provide a twofold answer to this question. First of all, uh, for to define the just transition, just and in other words, also fair transition the context really matters it's different from different sectors uh, also for different stakeholders and different territories so this is very important to also know what are the needs in the particular sectoral and geographical territorial context but also for a specific stakeholders. So that's why it's very important to talk about it, um, to have a dialogue at all levels, to understand how we can provide the best measures to you. That's one thing. A second one, in terms of indicators, I really um, invite uh, you to look at the proposal of the Commission for Just Transition Fund. Um, here you really have a list of different specific indicators and the last but not least um, we as i said we're going to discuss the whole week from the 29th of june till the 3rd of july about just transition with the launch of just transition platform so i would not want to give any spoilers to this great event so i really warmly invite you to to join us for the virtual week and you will find out everything uh, what you would like to know. Thank you very much. Anna, you're always a great promoter of the platform, a great salesperson for the platform. So I'm sure people will uh, attend the, the virtual week if they can. Uh, Timon, just briefly, um, I'd like to ask your opinion on how do you get stakeholders involved in social dialogue if there is a stakeholder group that is committed to the coal industry or is committed to the status quo. So that there was quite a pointed question in that regard of 
if you say, for, for example, have a coal mining community that is very much opposed to transition, how do you actually develop a meaningful social dialogue? How do you engage them? I, I was fearing that you put the heavy question to me. You could have chosen someone else. And, and I think, I mean, I, I think it's, it's difficult opening uh, a dialogue when when the discussion is very much focused on the loss and and of course for individual workers or sometimes for unions that that is the most immediate things uh, that is there there is job losses and, and how to compensate it um, I've I've seen examples of regions where um, basically in the shift of the discussion there ha or there, there has been a shift of discussion where they said well, maybe let's not talk about coal phase out so much, but rather about the the general perspectives of the region. And I found that very interesting. Um, and it's it's been by individual stakeholders or facilitators saying, let's not talk about coal today or coal phase out. Let's talk about what we share and what we have in common. And then the different actors, which were antagonists really in the beginning, they said, well, actually, this and this and this is what we have in common. And I've seen examples um, also, there is one prominent example in, in Germany, which I've looked quite intensively in, where unions very constructively have engaged and, and have a, had a very long-term thinking of, this is still at the horizon. That was 10 years ago, where they said, we want to sit together and plan for the region. And, and the, so that opens it up, but it, it can be difficult. And there's, I think there is no easy general answer to that. No, thank you, Tim. And I actually thought that was a very uh, full response to a difficult question. And like you, I agree. I don't think you should always look through just the specific lens of coal phase out. You have to ask wider questions about environmental quality, air quality, opportunities for future ch for future generations. What are the aspirations of the community for their children, etc. So yeah, you have to put it in a in a wider uh, lens of inquiry. Um, Maria, just a quick question for you, and if you could keep the response uh, quite brief. Many people were very impressed by how you looked at um, the question of coal phase out in a wider regional economic perspective. Can you just give a little bit of insight into how you mobilized a wider set of stakeholders beyond the coal mining community, beyond the coal power plants, and made it a, a wider discussion, very much about what Timon is talking about, a wider discussion and strategy a development process for the region as a whole. Yeah, well, this is similar, I would say, to when you lose somebody, like mourning, you know, you're mourning because at the beginning you don't believe what's going on, and after that you have to accept what's going on. We didn't believe we were going to close mines and coal plants, and then we have to accept that, and after that you have to try to recover yourself and you have to try to, uh, to share what you have. So we tried to get involved, all these initial, let's say, stakeholders, which who were very obvious. But after uh, several months, we realized that it wasn't enough and that we have to uh, widen our mind and widen also our, our perspectives and look around and see what we had. And what we did was we just took a look at the capabilities of Asturias, talking initially with other directors, directors generals of the, of the region who knew what they had and who knew that natural resources or uh, tourism were very uh, important strengths of Asturias. So we joined them in together inside our working groups and now we got these uh, multidimensional groups. But I think it was a process just exactly as when you lose somebody and you have to recover and you have to find other ways of, of uh, finding solutions. We were pushed to that by the situation, I would say. Thank you, Maria, for that for that a uh, thoughtful response. Um, and just to, you know, once again, illuminating the need for a more comprehensive approach in seeing transition, coal transition, within a wider uh, perspective of regional development. Andrea, you know, this uh, again, there's lots of unfair questions being put forward, but that, I suppose that is the whole point of a webinar. Uh, I had one question, or a, a question that came up on a number of occasions, is how do people understand what opportunities are available for miners especially who are losing their jobs how do you identify appropriate future employment opportunities and you kind of touched on that in your in your slide recognizing there's a demographic issue older workers and younger workers have you got even just a few closing remarks on that 
Well, I think the key here is really um, individual engagement and also um, uh, a, a group of people all providing um, different aspects. So, you know, if you've got the case of one person, um, so engaging with that person, finding out really what they need, and then having the systems in place to go to the appropriate organisations that can provide that support. So it really is a joint effort with these two elements of individual focus and then wider engagement with the people who, who can provide the support. That, that's what I'd say overall. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Sebastian, the, the last question for you. Uh, obviously, your presentation has um, made many people think about the, the potential input of your own organisation. And there was a question in regard to the role of the Just Transition Centre, the, the ICTU uh, Just Transition Centre. And it was just saying, what, what plans have you or have you got a mechanism for engaging at the regional level, especially in light of the Just Transition territorial plans, etc.? Yeah, thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, and I was surprised that uh, I didn't receive the question uh, that you sent to to, uh, to Timon about uh, how to involve uh, uh, some unions uh, in this process. But Timon uh, uh, gave a nice answer that I will not uh, add on that. Um, just in few words, uh, the, the centre will not have the solution. We, we don't have the solution. Uh, every every case is specific. Every people uh, uh, need to find a solution themselves. But what we are doing, what we're trying to do, to do is to putting people together, bringing people together around, around the table, to organizing some round tables, some seminaries, some, some uh, conferences, to put not only uh, unions, uh, but we start with them, we try to, to speak with them, to listen to them, to convince them sometimes with their argument and so on, especially to listen to their fears, to their where are their priorities, and then try to identify with them some solution or some, some, some pathway, and then we bring uh, uh, public authorities, government, and uh, employers also on the table to try to define uh, together uh, uh, different uh, solutions. Thank you for that, Sebastian. I'm conscious of the time. We have run over by three minutes, but we did actually start three minutes late. So I, I must thank all the participants and contributors for their excellent timekeeping. So I would like to just finalize by thanking you for participating in this webinar. I hope you have found it useful. We will be uh, responding to the questions that have not been answered. And once again, I would like to thank the excellent speakers and contributors who really have made this quite a meaningful uh, discussion today. And just by way of closing, I would like to remind uh, uh, participants that there is the virtual call week uh, between the 29th of June and the 3rd of July. So please do register if you have an opportunity to do so. And once again, thank you for participating and please do stay safe and please do stay connected with us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.